Hi, there are quite a few here that I've seen on the side screen yeah, that I know. So hello to all you people who I know for a long time, who've been on our previous webinars, who've seen us personally through all the seminars all over the world. Uh, some of you are really are old timers, huh? I mean, we know you for several, several years now. But there's also lots of new ones. And uh, it, we had a registration was of almost about 150 people. And some of you might join us uh, in the recording. And some of you here are online. So I always feel that the ones who are online are the enthusiastic ones. So a big welcome to all you. But of course, when you see the recording, also the enthusiasm is not going to go. And the amount of information you get is also the same. So don't worry. And you can also keep seeing this recording again and again, OK? So don't worry. If you miss something while I'm speaking, or you know, if you miss some bits of the case, you can just relax, because you're going to see the whole of the recording all again as many times as you want it. Yeah? Um, good. So you know what? For all of you who know me, yeah, Sachindra and I have been teaching for 20 years now. It's been a long journey for us, also a very interesting one. Yeah, When I say long, it's been a very good, happy, long, interesting journey. And we are at a point today where homeopathy is almost a second nature for both of us. You know, we could be sitting in a restaurant, we could be talking, we could be having a holiday, we could be at a party, and we are finding remedies. Yeah, I mean, we're not finding remedies consciously. It just, we just start seeing personalities around us. But that's after so many years of really drowning and swimming and enjoying homeopathy. And there are, there are different things that we have found out, research, that we teach all over the world. But the idea of doing this series, and you saw Rupal, yeah? Uh, she's our assistant for the last six years, a very, very enthusiastic young girl, and six months, sorry. Um, the idea that Rupal wanted us to do this was, uh, seminar series was mainly because she said we want beginners, we want them to understand, uh, we want them to come to this way of approach, and we want our doubts solved as beginners, you know. So this series specifically, has been targeted so that you understand our concepts from the very base. There are some people who have been attending our webinars and seminars for years now, 6, 8, 10, 12. But this one is specifically targeted so that a beginner understands where we are in homeopathy and how we deal with our cases. You could also be a very, uh, a very well-versed practitioner, but you might want to know what is that we are doing and how it can benefit you in your practice. Or it'd be a teacher who would be able to learn how to simplify things. Yeah? Because this is what we need in homeopathy at the moment. We need more people to practice this absolutely wonderful science. You know, when I have a case where um, I treat someone and they get so much better, the cysts dissolve, the pathological reports come back to normal, and more than that, the patient's personality makes a transformation, or uh, the patient finds satisfaction and contentment in their life. And when they come back and tell me this, you know, it really makes my day. And I think that's the one thing that's keeping both Sindra and me going, is the joy you get out of treating someone to such an extent. OK. To do the series. Now, over the next few sessions and today, I'm going to, uh, we're going to show you some cases, yeah? Take one illustrative case and explain to you the case, the understanding, the questioning, the line of questioning, so that you build up over these next three series, over these next three sessions, you build up an understanding of how we work. Yeah, it will be a glimpse, but I, I'm sure it will be a glimpse enough for you to get the essence of what we are doing, and then you will want to probably know more or follow us more at different other platforms. 
Mm, okay. Now, just before I go into the case, you know, I also want to tell you this, that over these last 20 years and having seen not only my and Sachinara's practice evolve, but seeing other friends and other very good colleagues practicing, one of the good things I've realized about homeopathy is that it has place for everyone. Every method or every style has its own advantages and can be used, you know, uh, to help the patient. Now, the reason why we do it this way, which is our way, is because, and you will know our way as soon as I show you the case, but the reason for doing this is because it gives me the glimpse of the whole patient. I think glimpse is a wrong word. It gives me a very profound understanding of the whole patient. Um, just before I go a little further, am I really clear, sound and video? just if you give me a feedback, so then I can keep going. Now, the reason Suchindra and I are in this method is, as I told you, we get a deep, profound, and a complete understanding of the patient. For example, let's say you go to watch a trailer, yeah? or there is a movie that has recently been released, and what comes out first is a trailer. What you see in the trailer? You see, you know, one glimpse of the boy and the girl kissing here. You see one glimpse of some trees falling. You see one glimpse of some action. You see one glimpse of someone dying. Um, you see, but these are all glimpses. Maybe these are the most important highlights of the movie. I don't disagree. But they are discrete scenes which don't make sense to you until you know the story linking all these highlighting scenes. And when you watch the movie, then you have a complete understanding of the story. Then you connect to the story. Then you then you know why was this woman kissing this boy and understand and why is that feeling that man and why was that tree falling apart and then you know, why was the earth falling to pieces to whatever one and then let me come the story again. And then you never forget that movie. And the movie teaches you something, something you learn. And this is exactly what happens with the kind of case taking that Sachindra and I do and the kind of understanding we come to at the end of the case of the patient and of the remedy, where it's not glimpses of a physical symptom here, a rubric, a materia medica sentence here, um, a few rubrics of the particulars, the miasm, and the generals, but I have no connection between all of them. It could remedy which covers all the rubrics, but I still don't understand. It's not like that. Today when I take a case, or it's been like this for several years now, once I've taken a case and once we have understood the remedy, and once we've understood the patient, then it's a connection of everything. We know why this person is suffering from these physical symptoms because what is it in the underlying persona that's creating this kind of symptoms? And what are the reactions of the patient and why these reactions or where these reactions are coming from? And then once we have this whole understanding of the patient, we prescribe a remedy. Very often, therefore, our patients come and tell us, even before we've prescribed the remedy, wow, I've understood something about myself. I never opened up like this before to anybody or to even myself. I'm feeling so much better now. Because they have become aware of their inner pattern. And that's what I'm going to show you through my cases. In each one of them, I'm also going to show you how to get to this inner pattern. What kind of questions will take you there? And what is this term that we're looking at? Okay, so good. Let's start with the case for the day. It's a 60 years old woman who came to me. What you can do is you know, just important symptoms. Just a few words. Yeah, it's a 60 years old woman who came to me with very severe cough. Yeah, she was checked for tuberculosis. She was checked for pneumonia. Um, she was uh, 
also checked for any kind of allergic asthma. Yes, so and that was the last final resort that they said, we'll just give you steroid inhalers to reduce the cough. We don't know what's causing such a severe cough. Um, she was suffering from this cough for almost about three to four months consistently without any break. And uh, people in the neighborhood actually started spreading rumors that he's probably dying, she's got a very bad cough. You know, some, some people even came and told her, you know, the, maybe the doctors forgot to check you for a carcinoma. You could have um, a lung cancer. Why are you coughing like this endlessly to death? So this was her main symptom, constant cough. It was dry cough, sometimes it would be productive cough, and it would be whitish mucus, loads of mucus and phlegm coming up. And sometimes in these three, four months, she's even taken several antibiotics because the white changes to green, yeah? Gets a little better and then goes back to white and then comes back to green. So she's had this completely intolerable cough for this last three to four months. She says, I cough so loudly that Everybody in the neighborhood knows that, you know, Mrs. P is coughing. It's so bad. I'm so embarrassed in my own house. I can't cough because it's so loud. You'll hear it. She says, the way the sputum comes out is I can't even control it in my mouth sometimes. It's just thrown out. Sometimes it's just a vomit, but I can't control my cough. I'm constantly on all kinds of syrups of the cough. There are times, she says, once the bout starts, it's continuous, it's uncontrollable, it never stops, and it's a long, long paroxysm. My mother had asthma, but this doesn't look like asthma. I don't know what it is, doctor, because I don't feel breathless. But she faints with the cough. She said, there could be times when I'm coughing, coughing, coughing. I probably get out of breath. I'm choking. I'm almost choking at the cough. It's like, <coughs> it's like a absolutely choking cough, endless. And then I just faint on the floor. And then, you know, my husband comes. They sprinkle water on my face. Within a few minutes, I'm up. And I'm like, what happened to me? I was just a bout of cough. I feel very, very uneasy. I think I'm going to die. And when I get that bout, I feel it's so severe, I'm going to die. And then I faint. Sometimes it's two minutes long. And then it stops, and I fainted. Sometimes I, I have to rush to the toilet because I've coughed with such severity that I already passed some urine and I might soil all my clothes. It's, it's an absolutely weird situation. There's nothing that I can control, doctor. I can't control the cough. I can't control the urination that comes out. I can't control the sputum. And then I just faint. It was very weird. As she was telling me this chief complaint, I could see some very, very peculiar characteristics. Very long paroxysms, suffocating cough, almost makes her faint, yeah? And then I could also see that the feeling almost, is dribbling of you, and then I could see that she's almost losing control, huh? She's losing control of the cough, the sputum, the urination, so it's kind of a, you know, in her physical symptoms. I'm only at her physical symptoms, but it was very peculiar for me that she had this kind of a symptom. Now, there is no rubric in the repertory concomitant loss of control cough with. Yeah? But uh, maybe when we go to the end of the case, I'll tell you why she has this control or loss of control. Yeah? But it was a very peculiar emotional concomitant that I found out as she was narrating the case. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention is that day in the clinic, this is about 2007 when we, um, you know, my husband was in another clinic practicing and I was here in the evening in, an, in this other clinic and she had actually got a reference of my husband. So actually when she came in, the first thing that she had mentioned was, who are you? Are you the assistant? Are you the receptionist? 
who are you? I'm not here to look for a woman. I'm here to look for Dr. Joshi, the male doctor. And so she, it was quite, you know, um, indignating for me in the beginning. And I said, you know, I had to calm her down. I said, look, you'll have to come another day because he's not in this clinic today. He works, uh, he practices elsewhere. Um, or you can speak to me, um, you know, equally good. I'm not so bad, you know. There is a big, I must tell you that this is a big thing in India that a male doctor or a male would definitely be 10 times better than a female. So, um, and she was like, uh, you know, in the very beginning as she was narrating these symptoms to me, she was not very happy. You know, she, she's not being treated by somebody superior. Some kind of thing like that. I thought, okay, if I want a good case, I just call up the and and I said, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this talk. And I'm not coming to you. But she had come from so far that she thought, you know, if I've come, I might as well at least give some symptoms to this doctor. So we were here at this point of the cough. Now, um, at this point, you know, as she was coughing and all of this, I said to her, this is only since the last three to four months, because now I wanted to know, what is the reason that this woman has developed a cough like this, which cannot be diagnosed, which cannot be treated? There must be something very, very important, uh, um, important in me in terms of something very dis unrestful. Yeah, something that's that's really causing her a lot of unrest. That must be happening for her to come up with something like this. And having worked over so many years with this concept, I have realized it's true for each and every case. And because I know it and I so confidently feel this is the reason, I can illustrate in it in each and every case, yeah? That there is always some emotional factor. Sometimes it's a very strong, immediate exciting factor. And sometimes it might not be immediate. It might be chronic. It might be a way of behavior of person, which a person has developed, which leads them to this point of illness. So one thing that I would really like to mention here at this point is it's really a it's something that helps us understand what's going on inside us. Our illness is a mirror. It reflects the inner disturbance. Our illness is here to tell us something within is going wrong, correct it. Or in other words, we are the authors of our own illness. Now, as a doctor, I need to know what has caused this illness. Or I need to know this author has caused this illness or I need to know this unrest that's come before the illness and I tell you it's there in each and every case and in some cases I get it straight right away in some cases it takes me 10 minutes to reach there in some cases one hour that depends from patient to patient but the unrest definitely exists and as I told you it could be something acute in the last few months or few years or it could be a pattern of behavior that a person has developed over years which has caused this unrest and therefore the illness. And if we can come to that unrest, find a remedy for that, we can obviously help the illness and the unrest. So let's see what happened in this woman. I said, this is only in the last three, four months that you're suffering like this. And she looked at me and she said, yes. And she said, in the last three, four months, look at my hair, doctor. Look, I'm having such tremendous hair fall. They've lost all luster. I've stopped looking at myself in the mirror. You know, I just, I just uh, as a habit, I go to my dressing table. I wear the million. You know, the Indians wear this vermilion or the bindi. She says, because I'm a married woman, that's the sign of my, um, the fact that I'm married. And she says, I wear that. I just drape a sari on and I'm out of the house. Whereas earlier, I would dress up. I would see that my sari matches the blouse that I wear. The jewelry that I wear matches everything. I am all well organized. She didn't say I'm dressed up. 
He said, I'm all well organized when I go out. My hair is in place, my purse is in place, and, you know, I'm, I look like a well-dressed woman who is out to, you know, do whatever. And nowadays my husband tells me, what, what happened to all of that? And I don't have energy and I don't have the inclination to tell you the truth, doctor. I am not interested. So the other thing that she has with the cough is that she is absolutely becoming disinterested in everything. And I need to know why. Yeah, I need to know what is behind it. I said, um, I have not understood anything about your cough. I have taken down the symptoms. Shall we just go a little bit into this disinterest that you have? Because it looks to me that in the last few months, you have, you know, lost interest with everything because of this cough. And if I understand that part of your personality, it helps me to understand the cough. So can we talk a little bit about this disinterest? And as I'm telling you, the reason for that is I wanted to know what was happening in the last three, four months of this woman's life. She says, oh, I'm fed up, doctor. I tell you, I'm totally fed up. What do you mean you're fed up? Fed up with cough, I said. And she said, she started to cry. And I said, I know this is very difficult for you, but I have to bring it out to be able to help you. So then she said, I'm crying because I'm very emotional, doctor. I think we should separate. I think we should stay separate. But I can't stay separate. She was sitting with her husband throughout the interview. <clears throat> She was sitting with her husband throughout the interview, and I thought, what is this? Does she want to separate him? What, what is she talking about? She said, I think we should separate from my son and his daughter uh, and his wife, my daughter-in-law. From the time she got to my house, I have done so much for her. And in the last few months, I really don't know what to say, doctor. So I said, it looks like you're really troubled by something that's happening in the house. If you tell me, I will be able to understand your personality. I'm not interested in the story, but it helps me understand your personality. So could you tell me a little bit more? And you know, until now, she was this woman who was uh, a little bit like, uh, uh, who felt herself a little superior, who felt, you know, what am I doing with this young woman? You know, I'm 60 years old here, I should be with somebody more experienced. And suddenly as she started talking about her story, about her family, yeah, all that demeanor, all that kind of, you know, bravado, just, she, she just, she just uh, dropped it. And she was more herself. And she said, it's my daughter-in-law, of course. They have been married, so her son and the daughter-in-law have been married for the past two years. And they are staying with her in the house, which is a very common thing. So this is a mother-in-law who's talking about the daughter-in-law. Now, for those of you who've seen some of our cases or who've seen Indian cases, you know that this is a very, very typical Indian story of a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. It's just that often you see mother uh, daughters-in-law complaining about mothers-in-law here. It's the other way around. We have a mother-in-law complaining about the daughter-in-law. And she said, they have been living with us for the last two years. This woman, when she comes home from office, the daughter-in-law is working. And our woman, our patient was initially working. She's, uh, a, she's worked in a bank for several years. And it's only in the last few years that she's taken a voluntary retirement and she stayed back home. So it's just the last five years or something like that. So she was working on herself. And she says, when my daughter-in-law comes home, doesn't she see that I have been working all day like a servant? I have been cooking. I have been cleaning. I have been taking care of her child. I have been doing all this at home. And sometimes I feel, Maybe I should go and tell her parents. 
maybe I should go and tell her parents, you know, what have you taught your daughter? She's not helping me with anything in this house. She can't see how much her mother-in-law is doing. Wait, doctor, I don't need anybody's help. I have done all my work, all my life by myself. I have done all the work. I never had anybody to help me. I never kept a servant. I never kept a cook. I never kept a maid. I have the habit of doing so much work. And yet, all my life, and I have raised my two sons, and I have raised all of this all by myself, without any help. I am very good at my work. I have always been. I could see that there was such a pride there in this woman that she had managed everything all this while all by herself. She said, I would get up early in the morning. I would send my children to school. I would pack their lunch boxes. Then I would pack my husband's lunch box and I would dress up and I would really dress up to the tea dog. Everything was perfect. And then I would leave my house for my job. And this woman that I brought home for my son, she has no sense of dressing up. She's very shabby. She does not know how to iron clothes. I come home and iron clothes and I iron them without a single crease. You should see how I do my things. So one of uh, as this woman was speaking, I realized that she was an absolute perfectionist. Yeah, her everything looks like it's just perfect. She says, this woman takes ages to pick up a cup. She takes ages to mop the floor. If I leave things to her, she will never finish any work in her, on her hand. I am so smart. I'm 60. She is 28. I'm almost double her age. And yet, I do things. Twice as fast as her. Don't she see that? Don't she learn from the mother in law? Don't she see how the children and the mother treated? The husband who was beside her intervened for a second and he said, My wife likes things just her way, and the slightest change in her style, in her routine, or in the way she makes her dish, she will not accept it. So that woman just gives up and says, fine, do it your way. If you, if you will do it your way, you do it. He had a little grin on his face as he was explaining. And our patient said, she said, it's not about my way or her way. It's about the right way. And she doesn't know the right way. She hasn't been taught. She hasn't been educated well. And I could see how clearly our patient had such high standards of herself and of from her daughter-in-law. You know, she was expecting so much out of her daughter-in-law. And when that didn't match up to her standards, this was where the problem was coming. Because what happens if this doesn't match up to the standard or what happens if that standard is not maintained? This was going in my mind. Yeah. She said, the uh, our option said, Do you know, doctor, when I make a lunch box for my husband, I have a box. Inside the box is an handkerchief. In the handkerchief are these very beautifully made chapatis. This is the Indian bread very neatly folded, kept one top of the other. And a lot of my husband's friends for all these years who were working with him would often comment on his lunchbox and say, my goodness, your wife does it so meticulously. Everything has to be done like that. And people would come to our house and say, oh my goodness, you know, this, your wife has so much of energy that she's a working woman and yet every time we come to your house everything is spin span everything is in its place so you know it wasn't it was so much for this woman it was so important for this woman 
everything perfect, to get everything very well done, you know, whether it was dressing up, whether it was cooking, whether it was cleaning, whether it was her job, yeah, or whether it was raising her children. Everything had to be done in the best possible way. So I, I asked this woman, I said, it looks like you need everything perfectly well. What happens if some, you know, if things are not up to the mark? She said, but that's what it has been for the past two years, daughter. But, she told me, I don't complain about this to a single person. I have Not one told all my sister that I am suffering so much with this daughter-in-law in my house. The only person who knows about this is my husband, and he knows about it because he's staying in the same house. And of course, my son. The she says, I can never talk to the outside world about this. Why should I? Because my world. I said, why? Why shouldn't you? Yeah, my, so I confronted her. What is the need to not tell the world about this? And what is the need to bring up such a question? I mean, such a point. She said, my world doctor is a closed fist. And that's when she made this gesture. My world is a closed fist. How can I open it to everyone? You know, the way she asked me, I, I still remember that gesture some years later. My world is a closed fist. How can I open it? It was almost like a jerk, you know, just like her cough. You know, it was like, how can I open it? She said, can't open in front of other people. They must always see this as a closed fist. I wanted to ask her a little bit more about this closed fist. You know, what is this? What is this fist that you are making? And she says, I've actually helped her doctor. I have helped my daughter-in-law the last two to three years. I have been cooking, cleaning. I don't let her do anything. As this woman was talking, I could realize what a plight it must be for the daughter-in-law in that house, that she does not allow anything else that is not her way. It must be absolutely suffocating for the daughter not to stay in this house and we had to help this woman out of this complete suffocative control that she had now I just want to make an observation here yeah or I want you to make this observation though this woman has not used the word control up till now can you see that she so much wants to be or is in control of everything or never gives up, yeah? She doesn't allow the daughter-in-law to make anything. She doesn't allow the daughter-in-law to do anything. And what happens with cough? So she doesn't allow, she's controlling everything. But what did she say with the cough? My cough is out of control. The sputum comes out, the urine dribbles out. I faint, almost like she is losing control. So here I want to make a very important connection between what happens in our mind and what happens to our body. Our body brings out the same things or the same fears that are in our mind. In her mind, she completely wants to control everything. When we want to control something, it obviously means we have a fear of losing control, right? And the body understands that the mind has the fear of losing control. So what does the body bring out? A symptom where you have that exact fear coming out, losing control. And this is true in every single case. Whether we can illustrate it or not is a completely different issue. But 
the connection is always there. Okay, now reason I brought this at this point is now you will see slowly how she talks about losing control and I just wanted you to be a little more aware of it. Yeah. So I was at this point in the case where I said I was going to ask her what is this closed fist of yours? But before that she said I never allow her to do anything. She can't cook well, she can't clean well, she can't iron the clothes well, she can't manage her own baby well. You know doctor, she got, a, she got pregnant and I took care of her. I decided what she would eat, what she would not because I wanted pregnancy to go very well. And then when the baby was born, it had a minor defect. And I thought, I can't let the world see my grandchild with a defect. This is totally impossible. So, and her parents all were very scared. So they didn't take her home and this, my grand, my daughter-in-law with the baby was staying with me. And all through those five, six months, immediately after her delivery, I was taking care of the baby. I took the baby to the hospital every day. I took the baby even to the surgeon and finally the surgery was done and the uh, defect was repaired. And she said, I did all of this. I couldn't let the world see this. I couldn't let the world see my weakness. I couldn't let the world see that we have a grandchild with a defect. I don't let anybody know what's happening to me. Now, this is very, very interesting because just a little before, she said, I, you know, when I asked her, she said, this is my closed fist and I don't want to open it. I don't want anyone to see. And now she's saying that with the grandchild, the grandchild had a defect and she has the same phenomena. I don't want anybody to see that defect. And it was very important to me to understand Okay, how is it now? Is it any better? <clears throat> now is it better? Yeah, okay. So I can see that there are rubrics I can take like fastidious, yeah? perfectionist, dictatorial. Yeah? She doesn't let anybody do anything. It has to be her way. Um, I can also uh, take, oops, let me see what other can, rubrics I can take. Haughty, yeah. I can take several rubrics like that. What I wanted to understand was why should nobody know what's happening to her? This is a slight peculiar language. Why? You know, she never said, okay, everything is going perfect and I have to do it perfectly. That would be carcinosin. Yeah? She didn't say everybody has to do it my way and I tell them what to do and I dictate over them. That would be more really dictatorial or egotistical. Like Pratina or Orin. But here was a woman who said, this is my fist and it should never open up to the world. It's like everything that she's doing up till now is building up to become her close fist. And what is this? Is this carcinosin? Is this platina? Or is it something else? Yeah? And what is it that, why doesn't she want her defects and her weakness to be seen? Yeah, and what does all of that have to do with the fastidiousness, the um, doing all things her way and the perfectionism and things like that. So I said, let's just leave everything aside. And if you can tell me a little bit more about the fact that the fish shouldn't open or that people should not know. What is it? Just tell me a little bit more about that. And she says, 
this is this is it doctor i can't let this open up and i said keep doing this face and tell me how it feels to open it up what is it that's happening to you and she says you know what this is doctor this is something that i have built this is something that i have held over years from the time that i married this man maybe from the time i was a child i don't know but from time i married this man from the time that i had the children yes from the time that i had my job and i had my house my house was everything to me my family was everything to me and i have single handedly brought it to this point today we have enough money today we have a big house we have everything and now my son says he wants to separate so it's actually not them but it's more the son who wants to separate out with the daughter in law that she's talking about and she says if they separate the whole world will come to me everything that i have held and built and kept together for all these years that is what this is and this has always been so strong she says try opening this fist doctor try it try it she is almost challenging me you won't be able to open it because i have kept it so tightly closed i have built everything for these 60 years of my life this is who i am this is this is strong this is this isn't me this isn't that i'm saying do it my way no that's my husband's opinion of me i don't think this is that this is me building everything this is my self respect this is everything i have put together all these years i can't let it open how can i let it open i can't let the world see my weakness and then she started again spree <clears throat> on another complaining spree i should say of how the drain not doesn't cook well doesn't clean well and blah 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 and i said no just forget all of it but if she doesn't cook well if she doesn't clean well and all of this if things don't go the way you think it is right what will happen and she said that's what will happen doctor this will open up the weakness will be seen and this house of mine will be open to attack will be open to criticism i can't let that happen and she came back to i've held it i've held it for so many years i've held it all my life and that's the reason doctor that's the reason now i have completely lost interest in dressing up in going out and you know doing anything because ever since my son said the la- a few months ago that he wants to separate i had the shock of my life i have been taking her tyranny i have been taking her torture for the last 2 to 3 years i have been cooking and cleaning in the house she was not doing anything and now my son wants to leave so her feeling is the the patient's feeling is that she has been doing all of this and you know taking care of everything which is true but unfortunately she has exercised so much control while doing it that she hasn't given anybody else space now when the son wants to leave for her space she said after all of this that i have done to keep this house together to keep this fist closed 
my son is going away and this could open i won't let it open i'm not going to let it open this is what it is doctor it was it was so interesting that her husband who was sitting behind he was sitting you know his chair was a little bit further behind hers and he was you know having this little smile on his face and he said that's what i'm telling the doctor give up your this give up your this and she said but this is not this is not my authority this is what i have created i am the one you know doctor and then she says i am the one the world knows the world knows my house my family respects me this is my strength this is all of me how how can you say give it up how can you say open it up you know doctor she said all my life i'm so strong i can do everything there's nothing on this earth i can't do there's nothing i can't do for my family i have never fallen sick in my entire life i had the children to take care of i had the family to support i had to earn i made two houses i never fell sick and i never say no to work i can keep working and working and working i never said until now i cannot do this thing i can do any and everything i have never said for any job and now in the past few months the whole world thinks i have lost control over my health now you see what i was trying to show you is that all these years from the time she was born until the daughter in law came into his life uh, into her life this woman has always done things her way built up her house her empire her life her strength everything because until then she was in charge she was in control and till she was in control she could never give it up or she never gave up and she built it and she made it strong that's what she keeps saying i've built this i've held this it's like a structure she's made for herself and the moment she she fears losing that structure because of the daughter in law the the, the daughter in law is immaterial here but because whatever situation she has started to fear losing that position losing that strength and losing that control and at this point she ends up with a physical complaint of cough which makes her almost lose control she's totally unconscious with the cough she can't control the the bouts and she feels she is that fist is opening up and and it's at this time now that she has started to in the last few minutes of the case that she has started to use the words that this fist will open up you know that fear that she must have always had is finally coming true with the fist opening up actually it was at this time that for me the case was very clear and the remedy that i wanted to give her was very clear in my mind of course i hadn't seen the rubrics because i was very clear from my on this of remedy pictures that i have made for myself which one she needs but i'm going to show you step wise the rubrics and everything so that you understand the whole picture and i did take the rubrics i'm not saying that i didn't but once i had got the complete understanding of this woman i then went to see what were the remedies that were coming up and this then helps me to see if 
what I have understood as a picture of this case matches with rubrics. The reason for doing this in the reverse way is I'll tell you why. Over years, our understanding of remedies has gone deeper and deeper and deeper or has evolved. Yeah. Uh, if you read my very first book, we've written all about four books now and my fifth book on the mammals will soon be coming. My very first book was a periodic table on the minerals and I, it's still my first love. Yeah. I really enjoyed writing that book and I really enjoy seeing a mineral remedy fold. Coming uh, back to the case, uh, what was I going to tell you? Why did I come to the books? Can you remind me why I came to books? Because our, uh, because our uh, understanding with remedies has evolved, but provings have not evolved. Yeah, we of course we st we are there are more and more provings coming up, but things take much more time. So remedies are at a certain level in our materia medica, and have not gone beyond that level, but. You can see the wisdom of that profound level even at the provings of the remedies here. You can see it. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you. But for me, once I had understood the patient, I had to understand, I, once I had understood the patient, the remedy for me was very clear from my own understanding of the minerals. And then coming to the rubrics was only a checking point. And then for me to see that my understanding, yeah, and it's not just mine, yeah, uh, it's in fact it was Ang Scholten who was the, he's the father of the periodic table, who came up with the whole periodic table and the understanding of the elements according to their rows and columns. I have only worked a little more and of course, you know, in your own practice, things are slightly different and you see them, you know, you refine it according to the way you see it in your practice, yeah? And we have also come to a whole understanding of the periodic table, which is very much based on Schulten's, yeah? But it has its own flair and its own slight differences where I'm, you know, I wouldn't say I differ, but I find some slightly different characteristics. And having that, I had the picture of the remedy and when I saw the rubrics were exactly matching, I could now understand the remedy, the rubric way, the materia medica way and I could understand why should this remedy have these rubrics? Why should this remedy have such kind of cough? So it was like a full circle. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you the name of the MIDI and the rubrics. Can we do a screen sharing and show the rubrics? There is somebody who says gallium. Very good. Somebody thinking of arsenicum. Cuprum. Mineral kingdom with cancer miasm. Very good. Oh, Giovanna is here too and Bob is there too, huh? And Roberto, there are some people we know for ages, ages. There are dear friends actually. I'm sorry, I haven't seen all the names. Oh, Tara is there as well. Maria Perry. Lovely. I'm sorry, the, the camera, I mean, the computer is not with me, so I haven't seen all the names, but just a big hello to all of you, yeah, the new ones as well as all my old friends, Chandra and my old friends. It's lovely to see you again. Now, are we sharing this? Okay. So some of you are very, very right, yeah, in fact, quite a few of you are, you're spot on. It is the fourth row of the periodic table, and just look at these rubrics here. You can see, they can't see it. Did so do it, screen sharing. 
Bob can see, can see. Okay, good. Very good. Oh, there are lots from India too. Huh? Good, 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 good. Now, mind delusions, imagination, general he is. This is the first one I took in the mind. Yeah? Because it's somebody who thinks himself, that's what she thinks herself to. Now, when you see this rubric in Materia Medica or in the repertory, I think it's from Kent, yeah, this rubric. Yeah, the delusions, imaginations that she, he's a general, that means he is completely in control. He's leading. And what is he leading? He's leading an army to attack. What does a general do? He attacks. Yeah. And what does he do? He defends the territory from attack. And he defends this fist from opening up. And that's what she has been doing all this time. She has been defending her fortress. She's been guarding her fortress. But what is the lurking fear? She might just lose it. It might just open up. Yeah? So, Delusion general he is, is the first one. Now this is from Kent. Delusions, imaginations, lose he will. Yeah, that he's going to lose a fight or lose control or lose whatever. Which is exactly what she's been telling me through her whole story. The girl is losing her position. She's losing. Oh, the other thing that I forgot to mention because I was just telling bits from K. It's a very good case and spoken in the local language. She kept saying, why doesn't she understand it? Why why doesn't she why doesn't she listen to me? Why doesn't she take my orders when I'm telling her that you know this is how we do it in this house? Why doesn't she understand? Then it will be lost. It can't be done her way, it can't be done the other way. So there's a constant delusion that she is going to lose what she built for all these years. This is from Nair. Then there is now look at the core rubrics, paroxysmal long coughs and there are only 19 remedies out of which cuprum is four marks yeah this is also this is from jar yeah it's jars provings then uh, uh, uh materia medica sorry cough paroxysmal uninterrupted spasms there are only seven remedies that's from um kent i think that's from kent cough consciousness loss of whip is also from kent and cough suffocative is from Bonninghausen. And you see you have Drosera there, which is also a very good cough remedy. But the first one, and the one which has all the rubrics, has cuprum. It's amazing that she's got all the rubrics of cuprum. Now, before I tell you why I thought of cuprum in our way, I a little bit about her follow-up because it was amazing. When I gave her the remedy, I said, look, I'm giving you a remedy. Your cough is going to get better, but believe me or not, your daughter-in-law will change. And I laughed as I told her this, you know, and she laughed and she said, I just wish that would be possible. I said, 15 days, just 15 days later, when you come to me, things will be different. And she couldn't imagine, you know, she just, but this time she didn't laugh at me with the feeling that she's this young girl who doesn't know anything, you know. She came 15 days later and unfortunately I was not in the clinic that day, it was Sachindra. And the first thing she said to him is, where's the lady? I want to speak to her. She was there the last time and she was wonderful and she understood me so well. Where is she? And then he said, don't worry. We, you know, we'll give you the same remedy and everything. How are you? And she said, no, 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 I have to tell you this. My cough's gone, okay? But that's not a, that's not the big thing. It's a miracle. She told me she's going to change my daughter-in-law. And ever since I've taken the remedy, I don't know whether my daughter-in-law's changed or not, but I have changed. I don't care about my daughter-in-law anymore. And obviously, she started to behave much better with me. It's a miracle, doctor. She, then she said to Sachinda, I started dressing up. I had wrinkles on my face and skin. I used to be telling my husband I have wrinkles. Fifteen days, the wrinkles are gone. And people around are telling me, oh, Mrs. P, you've started looking good again. Can you imagine that doctor? She did it fifteen days. 
do your remedies do that she was so shocked and she wasn't talking of the cough she didn't cough once i you know it's one of those cases where i every time i have a bad case or i have a bad day i think back of this one and i say if this was possible with one case it should be possible with every so it's a case it's one of those cases of mine which i bring out every time to um what do you say a uh, support me during bad times and to you know push me during bad days and just just the result in 15 days the cough was absolutely gone there wasn't any aggravation yeah there was just absolute amelioration and then i saw her one month later yeah so i saw her in 15 days we didn't repeat the remedy then we didn't do we just gave her a placebo and one month later we saw her so one and a half months later we still didn't repeat the dose because she was still doing much better they finally decided to separate yeah they i told you they had two houses so they decided to yeah the dose was 200 not 1m but a 200 okay so it was 200 one dose single dose and pills for 15 days um sl pills yeah uh, sacrum lactose pills for 15 days 3 in the morning 3 in the evening one month later they she gave them the permission they decided to separate she's far more calmer with her daughter in law she's not coughing she feels she looks more younger this is not her perception i think she looked fine even then but her perception that you know the real feeling that she has lost it or that she might just lose it has totally changed and she said i'm um, you know i i do things my way she does things her way anyways we're going to separate and i'm not you know pushing things only in one way there's no sense doctor they are you know, to lead their life they are the new generation and i'm very happy doing my own thing with my husband so we have finally decided and it's going to be all fine the cough we we did the x-rays and everything her chest was absolutely clear there was no haziness no congestion of any kind but let me tell you there wasn't anything before either yeah she's having none of these suffocative spells none of the you know um paroxysms and nothing just one dose of cuprim 200 could change her so much and not only could it change her physically with the cough but it completely changed her mindset emotionally it allowed her for, for a woman at 60 with her daughter in law she needed to give them the controls she didn't need to hold it and what the cuprim 200 did is it allowed her to understand her state and give away the controls not feel she was losing it but to be happy with what she had and to give away so this is one of those cases where you know i'll i'll never forget you know it's imprinted in my mind and i knew this would happen in 15 days you know i just knew it because it's there in the rubrics not um it's not our uh, what do you say intelligence or something it's just it's there in the rubrics it's there in the materia medica it's so well proved and it was so well illustrated by her that you know we couldn't have gone wrong in this case um now i must tell you a little bit about cuprim the way we see it yeah that's more important as to why we came to cuprim and some of you have lost sound can you can you hear me oh, we have someone from auckland carolyn how what time is it in auckland it must be evening huh in auckland very late <laughs> yeah for our um, webinar that we've been doing for like 4 years now or 3 years with the australians and the new zealanders they come at weird hours 3 am in the night and something but they're always there and they're watching it live not even recorded 
So I'm just amazed. Yeah, see, it's 11.45. Wow. Okay. Now, when you look at cuprim, just as an as a little, yeah, the poisoning symptoms of cuprim are that it causes tetany. It causes spasms. When you get the materia medica of cuprim, you know that it's an excellent remedy for continuous tonic clonic spasm. And what is a spasm? A spasm is where your muscles tighten up. And when do muscles tighten up? Now I'm not talking of epileptic fits, but I'm talking of a general state of a human being. Our muscles tighten up when we are trying to hold something, control something, then we stress and we do our best. That's when our muscles tighten up. So cuprum must have something to do with this control and holding and tightening. Yeah, it obviously shows that in the uh, uh, in its uh, poisoning symptoms and in the proving symptoms. Now let's look at cuprum as a source in nature. Good. They can see the periodic table, right? Very good. Now, when you look at cuprum, of course we know copper is a very important metal that has been used for centuries. Yeah? It's in the fourth row of the periodic table. And as I told you, that's the first book I ever wrote on the periodic table. It's my first love. It's a metal belonging to the fourth row. And when you get all the metals of the fourth row, like iron, nickel, copper, zinc, I'm going to say some of them, yeah, for, uh, not so much potassium, but chromium, yeah. Um, these are metals, gallium, germanium, that are used for a lot of uh, purposes for attack and defense. Yeah, um, to make um, barricades, gates, boulders, you know, iron pipes. Are, uh, or iron rods, copper and iron mainly rods are used to make the main beams around which the, you know, the main structures around them is the cement building stands up on them. So these are things which are used to build. And you know, this is what this woman kept saying. This is what I have built. This is what I have held. So the elements of this row, they are, of, they are called metals. Yeah, they are not called elements. They are called metals. They are strong. And they are used for building. And they are used for building fundamentals. They are used for building. They are used for strength. They are used for power. They are used for defense. A lot of in the olden days, yeah, when you look at the shields, swords, armors of the knights, yeah, uh, fortresses, states, everything that was used to protect, everything that was used to secure was made out of these metals. Obviously, in the energy pattern of these metals, and I'm going to use this word energy pattern often, because in the next few series, you'll how all our case taking is about understanding energy pattern of the patient and energy pattern of the remedy. Coming back to cuprum, all these metals in their energy pattern must have attack and defense. Must have building. Must have strength. Must have protection. So when you see um, okay, before when I see, I can tell you. Um, PowerPoint Even when you see rubrics, I'm coming, I'm taking it back to proving symptoms, yeah, so that you get a, um, you get it in perspective. When you look at the symptoms, 
in the Materia Medica or in the repertory, you see that these metals, cuprum, zincum, nickelum, have several rubrics and several symptoms to do with attack, defense, task, yeah, doing the potassium, you know, Kali. You know, Kali in the Futro, which is such an important, uh, dutiful, uh, important remedy for the role of a dutiful father or for the role of a dutiful who does his job, who makes his security, you know, arsenicum, he's so insecure. He's, he's so much money oriented and he's so much is miley. Again, money spells security. So when you look at the rubrics, if we just, um, wait, where do we go? Uh, yeah. One is you see rubrics, can you go back, please? Yeah, you see rubrics of work, task, protection, but also see other rubrics. And those are rubrics of fear, rubrics of, um, like, for example, fear of ghosts. Go next. Rubrics where there is vehemence, there is anger because someone has done something. And then this is funny. This is what I wanted to say. Generalities, heated becoming, fire, sun by. Yeah, aggravation from fire, heat, weather. Generalities, weather, wind, cold, wind aggravates. Anything that attacks you physically or mentally is what is important to the fourth row. Because imagine when you're building, when you are protecting, when you're defending, you don't want any attack. You don't want any ghosts. You don't want anybody killing you. You don't want anybody murdering you. You don't want anybody robbing you. You have also fears of robbers. Yeah. So these two, attack and defense, are very, very important themes to the fourth row. Or I would say they are the energy pattern of the fourth row. Now, this wind and sun and water is not funny. It's not coincidental that you have that in the proving symptoms. When you look at the metals of these rows, of this row, fourth row, these are the metals which are corroded and eroded by water, wind, and sun. Yeah. So, for example, the uh, noble metals, in I'm talking of the gold line, are not corroded and eroded. So, in gold, you see the feeling of the king. That's what you know Aurum is of. Yeah, Aurum is known for that. The silver line, now you know Argentum, you know Zirconium, Palladium. These are metals which you wear to show your beauty. So they have to do with performance and show. Oh, I'm better than you. I'm different. I know something new. I know something more. I'm extraordinary. But with the fourth row, you have common everyday affairs that are taken, that are well taken care of. Because what do you see in fourth row? You see metals that are not for show. Metals that are not so strong that they cannot be eroded and corroded. You see metals that are eroded and corroded. You see metals that are used for barricading. You see metals that are used for attack and defense. Yeah, that is the difference between the three rows. Now, let me give you a simple example. You have a tap in your house. What does a tap in your house do? It does the job of giving you water, faucets. Yeah, I think you prefer the, the Western world prefers to call it faucets. We in India still call it taps. Okay, so your faucets, hmm, your shower, everything is chromium plated. Yeah, it does the job of giving water in your shower room. And what is chromium? It's the fourth row. It's shiny. It does its job well, but it's still chromium. Now imagine you have a silver faucet in your house. That's something. That's extraordinary. That's the fifth row. And can you imagine old faucets? That's what the king has or the queen has. That is the sixth row. And what did we see in this woman? I don't I can keep my house together, I can feed my children, I can feed my 
then I can money to the house. I make two houses. I have my basics. I have security. I build everything. But that is her world. Her world is of a regular, everyday, secure life. Which is what you will see in all people who need the fourth row. Yeah. So that's where we go to the fourth row. And this is what she was talking. This is what I have built. The other important word used by fourth row patients or clients is building, holding, creating a structure, security. Yeah. And then she says, but this should not be lost. It should not open up. She's holding it so tight that it should not open up. And that is cuprum. The, the individual with spasms, the individual with such convulsions and such tightness in the cramps, cuprum we also know for is cramps. Cuprum, I can just show you the image that I have. Let me go. Let me just go forward. I don't need any of this. Yep. Oopsie. Oh, previous picture. This is exactly the picture of this woman and the picture of the man who needs cubro. You know, you're at the edge of that cliff. You can see that. I hope you can all see the picture. You see, he's so much standing at the cliff. And imagine the amount of control this man must exert to not fall off the cliff. Yeah? That's the feeling this woman has. She's exerting so much control. And for years and years and years, she was a successful cuprum, so she never fell sick. She managed to keep her fears at bay. But the fear was always there. Yeah, she always, you know, did the right thing, never let anything go out of control. She always was at this point on the cliff. But the moment the, the daughter-in-law came in, that fear which was, um, which was, which was tackled with because of her situation being good and she putting in a lot of effort, that situation had started to bring the fear out in the open. And the fear that she could fall off the cliff, that she could lose that position, that she could lose, that that fist could, was now so predominant in her mind that she would lose control. That's why the second rubric I had taken was delusion, lose, he will. And there are only, I think, two remedies in that rubric. I don't know which is the second one. One is cuprim. Was it Drosera? I don't know which was the second one. Let's leave it. You can always go back and look. So that fear had started to lurk in her mind. It was Drosera, huh? That fear had started to lurk in her mind. And that's when the symptoms started to come. And what did the symptoms tell her? She was losing control. The cough the suffocative paroxysm, the losing consciousness with cough, was telling her openly, bringing out her fear openly, that she will lose control. And naturally, cuprim has this kind of a cough because it's a cough of somebody who's holding on. Cuprim has spasms because it's somebody who's holding on so much and then gets epileptic fits, which is total loss of control. But even in that loss of control, there is such a tightness. Cuprum has tight cramps. The cramps in cuprum is such severe tightness because somebody who is holding on, somebody who has such a fear of losing their position, somebody who has such a fear of losing their security is what a cuprum personality is. And when they get physical symptoms, they are physical symptoms of losing control. They are physical symptoms where the cough is severe, you could lose consciousness. Or it's a cough where it's like a long, continuous, continuous spasm. It's 
So you have spasm because the fear is of losing control. You have epileptic fits, shrieking. It's also, I have given Uprim once to a little girl who had uh, epilepsy and she had shrieking along with that. Yeah, and she had patit mal and she had these kind of violent shrieks that she would give out in the night and not only the cuprum is a good remedy for that but was an exact picture of cuprum just like this woman and the child did very well with cuprum for petite mal epilepsy so you often see such a tightness in cuprum because there's such a fear of losing control and obviously when you're talking of control and losing control, this is the cancer myasin. Now the car carcinosin as a remedy has been proved long ago. Yeah? And cancer myasin has been introduced by several homeopaths. Now the cancer myasin talks of a person who is exercising control or exercising superhuman control. But can you imagine who would want to exercise control? Only somebody who has the fear of losing control. So in a cancer patient or in a cancer myosin, the inner fear is always of losing control. And the external expression is always of exercising control. But what is cancer as a? as an ailment it's exactly the same thing within our body there are cells that are growing and there are cells that are controlling the growth of cells and there is a constant balance maintained between the growing cells and the suppressor cells cancer is a disease or an, I wouldn't say disease is a situation or a, um, a, a disposition where the control over the growing cells is lost. Two important words, control and loss. And then what happens is that the growing cells grow abnormally and create chaos. So another very important word in cancer and disease is chaos, but in as a miasm is also chaos and that's why in carcinosin on cancer miasm just as you saw in this woman there is a tremendous tremendous need to control everything because the opposite of control is total chaos and so cuprum as a remedy is very very cancer miasm also, I feel all the remedies of the 11th column in the periodic table, if we just go back to the periodic table, yeah, 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 just that one. All the remedies in the 11th column, so you have cuprum, you have argentum, and you have aurum. They are very, very cancer myasm remedies because the fear is that you might just lose your position. You might just lose what you have achieved. Yeah? I hope you've enjoyed the case. I did. I tell you, every time I talk about this woman and this case, it just infuses me with enthusiasm for homeopathy. Because it reminds me that we can do so much with so many patients. Yeah? Um, we'll take another case next time and we'll talk a little bit about our case taking. Today I just wanted to give you a glimpse of how everything can actually be connected and be, be um, uh, not just connected superficially through symptoms but be connected through the energy pattern. Yeah? Um, and one thing, before we wind up for the day, um, I just want to introduce you to this is our fourth book, yes, that we have written. It's a very small book for the first time. Every book has been, you know, 400 pages and things, but this is a very short book. And this book is meant for doctors, practitioners, beginners, 
skeptics and for patients as well. It's a book where we have explained the process of how our mind works and why fall sick and how we can help ourselves and heal ourselves. So it's basically on the power of mind and it's basically on the personality that each one of us carries within ourselves. Um, definitely it has homeopathy because we have understood all this through the homeopathy. But it has this understanding of the power of the mind. And it has a few illustrative cases from our practice uh, to explain how these patients have healed themselves. It's also a good book where you as homeopaths can keep it in your click for your patients to understand how homeopathy works and how the questions you ask matter so much. Yeah. So uh, I think this book is available online now. We've just recently published it and released it. It's available online on our website. Do visit our website. Read about it. There are experts, excerpts from this book and I think a case and a little bit more of our philosophy. I want you to read through it and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we see, when do we see everyone? Oh, Fiona's from Brisbane as well. Lovely. Definitely from Germany, Amrita. There are lots of Indians and very good. Brad? I can't imagine, Bob. And lots of new Indian faces also, huh? A very big hello, very goodbye. Hope you have a great weekend and uh, we'll send you the link. Um, I'm also very, I'm quite happy that Indians are on this webinar. Yeah? We wanted more and more Indians and young Indian students. So I'm really very happy. Yeah? There are some names I don't know, but I'm sure you're very enthusiastic uh, practitioners. There's some from Croatia, lots of people from different places, Marius whom we know as well. So when is the deadline for submission for the links? Bob, that's typically you. <laughs> um, an email to you. Yeah. Could you just write us about the case? Send us the summary, Bob. Send us the summary of your case, but please, today or tomorrow, and then we'll, uh, we'll write back to you because we are way past the deadline. Okay, um, I also want to tell you my Indian students and friends, try and get more Indians because we want more Indians to do this. Now we have so many, uh, you know, we are such a big population, we are such a big country. We can help so many of our Indian patients with this, yeah? and. Uh, have a great weekend, all of you. We'll put up, uh, Rupal, when are we putting it up? Tomorrow it will be online for you to see the recorded version or send it to your friends. You can send it to your friends if you have liked this. And if you think this is going to be helpful to you, please send it to your friends. Yeah? Let them um, know about this. Let them see this. You can send it to as many people as possible. I'm sorry if I have missed out some names because as you know, I'm not seeing the laptop where I can see you, all your comments. So if I've missed out some people that I know or don't know, a very big hello and goodbye to all of you.